All right, in this little video, we've got a, we've got a picture here of, of a typical action potential, and we want to go through the different colors and understand what's going on with each step. But before we do that, I think it's relevant to actually define what this actually means. When we say, when we say action potential, let's break this word down and try to understand the principal components. Hopefully it's easy enough to, to think about action. Uh, and it's important to recognize that this action might be different depending on the cells that we're, we're talking about. In a neuron, that action, the thing that's going to happen, is exocytosis. Exocytosis is the release of neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter is going to cross uh, a synaptic cleft and it's going to bind to receptors on other neurons or other cells and cause them to do something. So the action is exocytosis. If we think about muscle, like skeletal muscle, it's not exocytosis. The action there is allowing calcium to escape from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, what we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that calcium drives muscle contraction. So depending on the cell type, the action could be different. But the idea is that whatever's going to happen is going to lead to some sort of action. The other word that we want to look at is potential. And this, this gets people stuck a little bit. Consider, for example, two different batteries. So here's maybe a double A battery and then a nine volt, those little brick batteries that you put in things like smoke detectors, right? Double A, nine volt. What are the differences between these two batteries? At the end of the day, the principle of a battery is the same. It's, it's the flow of electrons from one point to another, uh, something that wants electrons more, more electronegative. If we look at a AA battery, we read the label and it says it's a 1.2 volt battery. And we compare that to this other battery that's a 9 volt battery. Of course, taking the 1.2 volt battery, you can't really stick it on your tongue and have everything happen. But a 9 volt battery, you stick on your tongue, you feel that. That's kind of a fun thing to do. What's the difference between these? You know, we might even consider a large, you know, a big, huge car battery. These things are, are large bricks. You know, we got a post here and a post here. And this one isn't much bigger as far as volts go. The car battery is only a 12 volt battery. And yet, even though it's only just a couple of volts higher than this smaller battery, the 9 volt, there's no way I could start a car with a 9 volt battery, right? It's not going to happen. So when we think about potential, it's the same thing as voltage in a battery. It doesn't describe the overall power or current that we can get, but power is going to be a combination of voltage and current. The voltage itself, though, the voltage, this value describes desire. How badly those electrons want to move. The higher the voltage, the higher the difference in electronegativity between positive and negative ends, and the greater the desire the electron has to move from one thing to another. So how does that term potential apply to a cell? Well, we should be comfortable setting up what we've called resting membrane potential. We can, we can actually see that over here in cyan. This is my resting membrane potential. And we have actually labeled that as minus 70 millivolts right? Again, going back to the idea of a battery, we're measuring this in volts, the potential or the desire that something has to flow. How did we get to resting membrane potential? Just a quick review. It's a two-step process. Here's our cell. The first thing we want to do is set up a sodium potassium pump. This pump uses ATP. That makes a primary active transport, and it pumps three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in. That's step one. That creates gradient, right? Primary active transport is used to create gradients. And we see the gradient. Sodium, high on the outside, low on the inside. Potassium is just the opposite. High on the inside, low on the outside. The second thing to set up resting membrane potential is then to increase permeability for potassium. So we open up a leak channel for potassium. Because there's so much potassium in the cell, Potassium wants to leave. 
then every time a positive comes out of the cell, the cell gets more negative. The end result is that along the inside of this cell, I have a lot of negatives butted up against the membrane, and on the outside, I have a lot of positives. Of course, for every positive, there's a negative in the body. We don't have a, a net difference. We're not charged individuals. But now we can see in picture form what a potential is. Equilibrium wants us to be all balanced, right? No difference in charge. And yet we've worked hard with the sodium potassium pump and the potassium leak channels to separate charge, to put positives on the outside of the cell and negatives on the inside of the cell so that I give a desire for things to move. As an example, right? What happens? What happens if over here I open up a door for sodium? I know what sodium wants to do, right? This describes the potential or the desire. Sodium, because it's concentration is high on the outside, low on the inside, certainly wants to go down its concentration gradient. It, it would stochastically move into the cell. But we can increase that drive if we think about charge. Sodium is a cation. It's got a positive charge. The inside of the cell is negative. This is the potential that we're talking about, the attraction between positives and negatives and the desire the physical attraction that sodium has to move back into the cell as opposite charges attract. Combined with the steepness of the chemical gradient, the difference in concentration, we term this the electrochemical gradient, where for a charged particle, the electro portion describes the potential, the difference in charges and whether it's attracted or repulsed. And the chemical part of the gradient describes the concentration gradient itself, where passively things will always have a net movement from high to low. All right, so what does this have to do with the action potential? Well, the action potential is taking advantage of this potential, the desire of things to move, and using the movement of ions to actually perform a task. And we can break down the specific phases of the action potential with the graph that we've shown here on the left. So one of the things that we want to do, we want to come down and see if we can actually follow the instructions down here. It says label the following. Ions associated with each stage, the channel types. We've already got resting membrane potential. We've got this thing called the grade of potential, what the action potential is, depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization, absolute refractory period, and relative refractory period. Those are the things that we want to define. Well, we're off to a good start because we've already got resting membrane potential figured out. We know how to set it up. We know why the cell exists at minus 70 millivolts on the inside, right? That's where we're measuring this. And it has to do with the sodium potassium pump and then increasing potassium permeability. Potassium leads through leak channels. The more potassium it leads, the more negative I get. Here, we have enough potassium leaving to maintain minus 70. But then we see this next phase here. What's going on? What's going on with this? We see we see this area right here where where we have a blip that goes up. We also see this area right here that has a blip that goes down. I want you to recognize first and foremost that this isn't a pattern we see in everything. For all we know, maybe it just goes like this, right? Maybe it just goes straight up or maybe it just comes straight down and hangs down here for a while and then goes up. There's infinite possibilities that could happen. We want to understand what's happening and why. But the first thing we want to do as we go through this stage is understand the channel types associated with this stage. So this area right here is what we call the graded potential. So we're looking at, looking at this region right here in magenta. And like I said, it doesn't have to look like this. It could look like anything. What's going on? What are the channel types associated with this stage? 
Well, the cool thing about graded potentials is that there are multiple channel types and the response we get depends on the channel being used. To highlight that, let's take a look at a neuron. I'll draw a neuron down here. We can briefly describe the anatomy of this neuron, the cell body. Uh, this area up on top is the, the soma. We have here a dendrite. The dendrite is for input. And then in most cases, we have a single axon. And this is all about output. And that's going to end down here in an axon terminal. And the axon terminal, as we mentioned above, this is where exocytosis takes place. And that's the action that we're trying to get to happen with our action potential. So we've already set resting membrane potential. We know that we're on, that we're at minus 70 millivolts inside. Okay. As we think about the graded potential, the graded potential is all about input. So let's, let's zoom in onto these dendrites and see if we can understand that. This is typically going to be regulated by a ligand gated channel. Now, if you recall from our, our discussion on movement, ligand gated channels are facilitate are an example of facilitated diffusion, and they are specific. So let's say this ligand gated channel is specific for sodium. We have a different neuron here. There's the, the axon terminal, and inside it's got vesicles loaded with neurotransmitter, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine. There's lots of different kinds of neurotransmitters, and they're inside these vesicles. And when exocytosis happens, these vesicles fuse with the membrane, and what was inside of them comes out. This is my neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is the ligand for our channel. Now, I've got lots of ligand-gated channels, and there are lots of potential ligands available to me. But for this one in particular, we've already got the, the channel drawn in place. As that ligand comes and binds, what happens? The ligand is the key that opens the door. So with the ligand now bound, this door is going to swing open. We can see that movement taking place. Now that the door is open, what's going to happen? Well, we know that this is specific for sodium, and we also know that due to the sodium-potassium pump, the gradient for sodium is high on the outside, low on the inside. The electrical gradient is also a pull toward the inside because sodium is a cation, and the inside of the cell is negative. So what happens? We get a massive influx of sodium through that channel now that the door is open, and sodium comes into the cell. Now, consider, make sure we understand this. We're at minus 70. What happens to that potential when we start adding a bunch of positives to the inside of the cell? I hope you can appreciate, if we go back up and look at our graph, that the influx of sodium leads to a depolarizing event, right? This is the word right here, depolarization. To depolarize means to get less negative. Remember, to polarize means to separate charge. The more polar I am, the more farther apart I am between positives and negatives. But if we put zero on our graph up here, right, here's zero millivolts, anything going back towards zero represents a depolarizing action. And so as these positives come in, we recognize that that could very easily describe what we see right here. Well, what about this part right here? We're actually going down and even a little bit below threshold. What could do that? Well, let's go back down to our neuron. What if, let's draw another channel over here, another ligand-gated channel. We've got another neuron coming in. And this neurotransmitter happens to be GABA or glycine. These neurotransmitters tend to bind to chloride channels. So this is another ligand-gated channel, but this one's specific for chloride. Now, remember, chloride is an anion. It has a negative charge. So as this door opens, as this door swings open because the ligand is bound to it, 
chloride comes rushing into the cell. Well, now instead of positives coming in, now we're filling the cell with more negatives. I hope you can appreciate very quickly that that's going to lead to a repolarization or even a hyperpolarization. That's going to describe this kind of stuff right here, where we're actually going below threshold. And I also want you to appreciate that we could have these two things happening simultaneously. We could have one signal coming in, opening up ligand-gated sodium channels, but we could have a competing signal coming in, opening up ligand-gated chloride channels. The idea, and we'll talk more about this at another time, the idea is that we take all of the positives that are coming in and all the negatives that are coming in, and we add them all up in a process called summation, Summation simply describes adding all of this stuff up to help us decide what the cell is going to do. This is how it figures out what's going to do. Now, you can appreciate if I have the same amount of positives coming in as I have negatives. Let's go back here, clean this up, right? That's just going to be a, a simple flat line, right? The positives and negatives cancel each other out. If I have more negatives than positives, I'm going to go down. If I have more positives than negatives, I'm going to go up. That's why we call it a graded potential, because the gradations or the differences just depend on what the input is that's coming in. That said, this potential has one goal in mind, and that goal is to get up to reach this line up here that we call threshold. What's so magic about threshold? Threshold simply describes the value at which my voltage-gated channels open. To be clear, this is true for all of my voltage-gated channels. Because different voltage-gated channels have different rates at which they open, they work mechanistically different, then when we actually see them open could be different. But this threshold is the trigger at which they open. And so using the scenario below, we had a ligand-gated sodium channel open, and we brought in enough sodium to reach threshold. Maybe we had some competing interests, but at the end of the day, we reached threshold. That threshold, what do we see happen? This blue line, this is the start of my action potential. So action potential starts here when we reach threshold. What drives it? This is all driven by voltage-gated sodium channels. These are fast-acting channels that are essentially on a timer. They open, count to two, and then they close. But because, and we described this earlier, but because of the, the significant pull, the desire that sodium has to go into the cell, if I increase sodium permeability by opening up, opening up a voltage-gated sodium channel, sodium is going to rush into the cell. So we see, because all of these positive ions are rushing into the cell, we see a significant depolarizing event. We might even hit out here, we might hit plus 20, we might hit plus 30, because all of these sodium ions are coming in. Now, I do want to be clear when we see this value, I don't want you to think that the entire cell is flipping its charge. That's not true. But locally, where these channels are, I do flip the charge. I can move locally in the membrane an area from negative to positive. So this is all driven by voltage-gated sodium channel. Now, what happens up here at the top, right here at the peak? Right here, these voltage-gated channels close. That's why I stop going up, because I'm not letting any more sodium in. Of course, if something else doesn't happen, then I just kind of maintain this plateau, right? And that's not what I want to do either. So why do we go back down? Well, taking lessons learned from setting up resting membrane potential, what's the fastest way for the cell to repolarize? How did we get to minus 70 in the first place? potassium, right? The more potassium that leaves, the more negative the cell gets. And so here we have our voltage-gated potassium channels finally opening up. The trigger to open up was still threshold, but these are slower in activating. They're finally now opening up. And as they open up, 
I increase permeability to potassium. What does potassium do? Potassium leaves the cell. That's its concentration gradient. Then as potassium leaves the cell, the cell gets more negative. So this is how I repolarize. This is how I reset the system. Now, interestingly, we do, have, we do have this bit down here shown in red. Here's resting membrane potential right here. But we see this dip, right? We actually go below resting membrane potential. This section we call a hyperpolarization event. Now, why God built that into the system? I'll show you in just a second. It's actually quite cool. But I want you to recognize... Because we still have, during this entire phase, we still have not only the leak channels that establish my resting membrane potential, but also, or in addition to, we have these voltage-gated channels. So my potassium permeability is still very, very high. Lots of potassium is leaving. That's why I get more negative. But down here, we finally start to see the majority of these potassium voltage-gated channels close. And as they close, then the only permeability for potassium once again because, becomes the leak channel. And we start to taper off again with our resting membrane potential. So now we can see all of the different ions and channels associated with these different phases. Of course, my resting membrane potential, this is all about potassium leak channels. The graded potential shown in magenta, this is all about usually ligand-gated channels. It could be mechanically gated channels. You know, we, we see this with hearing or with touch, right? You feel that pressure. So there are other ways to, to get this graded potential going. But if we're talking about neurons in the brain, this is all ligand-gated channels. And it could be different ions. It could be primarily sodium as my dominant cation that's going to depolarize or chloride as my dominant anion that's going to hyperpolarize. But certainly other ions could be involved as well. Then we hit threshold. This is where the action potential starts. This is all voltage-gated sodium. They close. On the backside, now we have the voltage-gated potassium channels that drive repolarization and hyperpolarization. And as those voltage-gated potassium channels close, then I go back to just permeability defined by my pot potassium leak channels, and I find myself once again at resting membrane potential. All right, now that we have all of that stuff labeled, there's just a couple other things that we want to talk about. And that is these two terms right here, absolute refractory period and relative refractory period. Defined, the absolute refractory period is a time when the neuron, or other cell, I guess, cannot fire an action potential. Why not? Because it's in the middle of an action potential. And we can see absolute refractory period if we go back up to our graph, beginning right here and ending, this is a little bit more arbitrary, but somewhere in here. So this space in time from here to here defines my absolute refractory period and is a time where I cannot, no matter what stimulus is coming, I cannot fire another action potential because I'm in the middle of an action potential. Now, this arbitrary time on this back end is defined by a time when the majority of my voltage-gated channels close. And that's, that's a hard thing to measure. But, you know, it's, it's somewhere right there at threshold or just beneath threshold. The relative refractory period is a safety measure. This is defined as a time when the neuron can fire again, but it requires a heightened stimulus. So with increased stimulus. Now, I can show you that because I want you to consider if we look at resting membrane potential back over here at the beginning, look at how much sodium needs to come into the cell to get to threshold, right? We're measuring this much sodium. But if we look at the hyperpolarization phase, and this is why it's built into the system as a safety mechanism, it's possible 
to fire again, but look how much sodium I need from down here to all the way up here. In other words, I can fire again, but an average input isn't going to get me there. It has to be kind of an emergency situation, right? So this safety mechanism is built into the cell because I can't, I can't prolong action potentials at that rate without messing up my ion concentration. So I need this rest in order to make sure that my ions are all balanced. But in some, in some instances, I can override that safety mechanism by providing a significant input. As long as there's enough input to hit threshold, I can fire another action potential during that relative refractory period. So that relative refractory period is defined at the end of the absolute refractory period back to right here when I get up to my resting membrane potential. So hopefully you can kind of understand now what an action potential is. You can see how it works. Let's finish the story down with the neuron. We've got the graded potential already shown. We've got a bunch of sodium and chloride coming in. Maybe it's just sodium. This time sodium wins, right? What's next? Then what's next is my voltage gated sodium channels. And those are found along the axon, right? Where we have, again, positive. We'll just draw a few of these and negative on the inside. When I open up that first voltage-gated sodium, and it opens because there's a lot of positives that came in, right? That triggers that voltage-gated sodium channel to open, and now sodium comes rushing into the cell locally right here. Well, we showed that that has the potential to change the charge so that now locally I'm positive on the inside and negative on the outside. Well, that positive charge right there is enough to trigger the next voltage-gated sodium channel. So now sodium comes in here and we fire again. That triggers the next one. Sodium comes in here and we fire again. Triggers the next one. Sodium comes in here. We fire again. These are all turning positive on the inside. Negative, negative, negative. Of course, on the back end of this, we've got my voltage-gated potassium channels opening, and they're repolarizing. So now we've got this one going back to a negative, and we restore the positive outside, again, because of the voltage-gated potassium channels. But we can see that this sodium is going to propagate an action potential down the axon like a big wave, right? The first one fires, then the next one fires, then the next one fires. And this is going to go all the way down. We'll just show you how it ends. Here, we're going to open up a voltage-gated calcium channel. And as calcium comes into the cell, calcium drives exocytosis. And that equals the release of neurotransmitter which will cross the cleft, bind to another ligand-gated channel, and start the process again in a neighboring neuron. This is how your brain works.